priests, scribes. And they're always looking for ways to condemn him, to trap him. Today is no different. They're there once again. They are looking for ways to trap him. Now, the Jewish leaders had decided not to approach him, not to try and arrest him during the festival. They didn't want to pull the attention away from the festival. So they had decided we'll wait and then we'll pursue him again. But God had other plans. God had a different set of timing. God knew this was the time that Jesus was going to be arrested. This was going to be the time that salvation would come. God's plan, not man's. The second reason that he enters the city is Jesus challenged the religious leaders. When he went into that city, he basically threw down a gauntlet to them. Sure, they didn't plan on approaching him right now. But he knew it was time. See, everything he had done up to this point, whether he was casting out evil spirits, raising the dead, healing people, he did it out of compassion. But now, as he enters the city, as he confronts the religious leaders, he's doing it very intentionally. It is time that his actions were a personal affront to these religious leaders. Then Jesus came, secondly, as a servant judge. The next day, after staying the night in Bethany, he returns to Jerusalem. Two events are going to occur. It's unusual for Jesus to pass judgment on someone, but today, today is the day that they need to see judgment. The first event, Jesus cursing a fig tree. This event is confusing for many. And we're going to look at two reasons why he would curse a fig tree. But first, let's read about that event. We find it in Mark 11, 12 through 14. Now, the next day, when they had come up from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now Jesus has the power, if he so desired, to make that tree produce fruit. Just as he had the power to change stones into bread, if he so desired. But there was two reasons why he did it. The first reason it's an object lesson on failure. For those that don't follow sports much, we are in the midst of what is known as March Madness. March Madness is when teams gather from all over the country and try to win the national championship for both men's and women's basketball. Now in basketball, much like most sports, the object is to score more points than the other team. You do that by putting a ball through a hoop. You take shots, attempting to put that ball through that net. Now there's many reasons why you might not get that ball through the net. It could be you're just shooting from too far away. Could be an off balance shot. Could be you're just not talented enough to put it in the hoop. Probably the biggest reason, though, you don't score is the opposition. They're trying to distract you. They're jumping up and down, waving their arms, trying to block your shot, doing anything they can to keep that ball from getting into that hoop. But if you've coached or watched a lot of basketball, you know that 
once a player takes a shot, the first thing he's supposed to do is follow that shot and go up in case it misses and try and get a rebound. Everybody on the court is supposed to follow the shot and go after that ball, trying to keep possession so they can, again, attempt another shot. If they don't, they could see failure. They could not score. Now, as we look in the Bible, there are several people in the Bible that have missed shots. The question is, did they follow up that shot? Did they get back up? Did they move forward? Or did they just go off the court? Did they give up? Did they quit? Here, the leaders of the nation of Israel have missed their shot. The leaders of the nation of, nation of Israel are like that fig tree from a distance. You can see the leaves. It looks like they're doing things. It looks like they're doing the right things. When in truth, they're being legalistic. They're pointing fingers at others, accusing them of being sinners when they themselves were sinners. We, like Jesus has been teaching here, need to trust in God fully. We need, <clears throat> excuse me, to not be legalistic, not point those fingers at others. You've probably heard, <clears throat> if you're pointing a finger at someone, you've got three more fingers pointing back at you. We need to not allow Satan, the enemy, to distract us. We need to get up and follow through continue on, keep pressing, trusting in God. Not thinking of our earthly status, our earthly reputations. The second reason is a lesson on faith. When Jesus and the apostles pass back by that fig tree again in the evening, they see that it's dead. It's dead from the roots from up to the, the tips of the branches. All the leaves are off of it. That tree will never produce anything again. And the apostles asked him about it. Here's Jesus' reply, Mark 11, 22 through 26. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that these things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Jesus teaches on faith. If we have faith, we can move mountains. The leaders of Israel have misplaced their faith. They, like that fig tree, do not have faith to move mountains. If we trust in God fully and we make requests of him, we pray to him, we make those requests and expect results, we'll see results. So long as those requests are within God's will. The second judgment, Jesus cleansing of the temple. This is actually the second time that Jesus does this. The first time we find it in John 2, 13 through 22. <laughs> However, the results are only temporary. It doesn't take long before the priests are allowing people back into the temple to sell their goods, the money changers. Mark 11, 15 through 17. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought 
and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, It is not written, is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. But you, you have made it a den of thieves. Now Jesus is actually quoting two scriptures there. First about a house of prayer, and the second about the den of thieves. Those are found in Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11. Now the Jews looked at the temple primarily as a place to offer their sacrifices. Jesus is wanting to make sure that they know that it was first and foremost a place to be with, near God, to honor him to talk to him, a house of prayer. Theologian Campbell Morgan points out that a den of thieves is a place to which thieves run when they want to hide. The priests and scribes were using the temple and its religious services to cover up or hide their sin and their hypocrisy. The priests and scribes after this are now seeking desperately to stop Jesus. Next week we're going to look at more confrontations in that attempt. But before we condemn the religious leaders of that day, we need to examine ourselves. Do the outsiders in our community think of this building and other churches in the area as houses of prayer? Are church members sometimes fleeing to the church to hide from their sins? Do church members attend in order to maintain a reputation or do they come to worship, to glorify God? If Jesus were to walk into our church today, would he be pleased with what he saw or would he start turning things over? See, the church in the past has had a reputation of hypocrisy, a reputation of persecution. The church's history is not necessarily a pretty history if you go back and look at it. Now we here at First Christian Church consider ourselves as a Reformation church. Basically what that means is several years ago, people looked at the way people were behaving, the way things were being done, the things that churches were being used for, and they said, that's not what the Bible says. The Reformation started taking place. Changes started taking place. The Bible is the core of the church. It's our guidebook. That's where we follow God, closer <coughs> to God. <coughs> Unfortunately, not all denominations are doing that. They're taking their own directions. They're letting the world dictate what they teach, how they teach. And they're following earthly direction rather than godly direction. I pray that we are indeed here to please God, to honor God, to be with God. I pray that this is a house of prayer. That's why we should be here. Now, as we come into our time of meditation, Perhaps you don't already know Jesus as your personal Savior. You haven't said, Lord, you are the Christ. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that yet, you can do that today. You can accept Jesus as your Lord. If you've already accepted Jesus as your Lord, and you're here visiting with us, and you're looking for a place to call your church home, you can come forward today and make this your church home, a place that believes the Word of God, that tries desperately to follow the Word of God. 
Lord, if you've got a prayer need, something we haven't already mentioned, something you'd like individual prayer for or congregational prayer for, you can come forward and make that request. If any of these things meet your need today, I invite you to come forward as we now stand and sing our song of invitation, page 41, God is so good. around Jerusalem for that following week before he goes to the cross. Next week we'll be looking at more confrontations. Almost seems to be the central theme in the book of Mark. How many times in different ways that Jesus is confronted by the different leaders, the different questions, and the different ways they try and entrap him. Next week we're going to look at four questions that they ask him. Then he turns it around and asks them a question. Join us next week. And don't forget about tonight, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. Youth will be meeting and eating taters. Eating taters. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, let us ever be mindful of being in your presence, lifting you up talking to you. Lord, we love you and thank you for this time we've been able to share together. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.